In 2010, Nissan unveiled the Leaf electric hatchback to the world. It was, with the exception of the Mitsubishi Aimeave in some parts of the world, the first mass-produced all-electric car you could actually buy from a mainstream manufacturer that you could keep as your very own to hug and to pet. And that means not an EV that you had to lease and then watch getting taken back and crushed. Gee, I'm looking at you. This is a car that you could actually buy. Asterisk. Okay, so I know that you could technically buy the Toyota RAV4 EV for a really short period of time at the end of its limited production run, which is how some Toyota RAV4 EVs escape the crusher. I owned one for a while. But yeah, let's run with what I said because I can't figure out a better way of phrasing it and we are on the internet. Someone will always have a problem with how you say things on the internet. More than half a million Leafs have been sold globally since its launch, and while sales have tanked considerably in recent years, the Leaf is still a common sight on the world's roads. More importantly, I think it's still a valid choice for a used EV today, and I'm about to explain why. Yeah, I can hear the gasps of shock and horror from across the room, but hold on to your hats, because I think the EV YouTube world is just too harsh on the leaf, and in 2023, as we push automakers hard to make sure that more affordable and equitable access to EVs exists, we here at the channel are going to do more coverage of used EVs. Let's do this. So, yeah. My opinion has changed of late. The Nissan Leaf, a car that most people, including me, no longer recommended as a good EV to buy new, is actually still a good EV to buy. And I say that as someone who has owned two of them. At least, it is a good EV to buy for a subset of buyers looking for a new car. But I think many of us in the EV world have forgotten that those subset of buyers exist. It's something that I've been reminded of late when I and Kate Walden Elliott were giving a private EV consultation to a viewer of this channel. Incidentally, if you'd like to have our help buying a new EV, just follow the link below to book your own consultation session today. I'll, I'll wait. The Leaf being good for many people is also something that I've been slowly reminded of over the holidays, watching videos from Kyle at Out of Spec Motoring, and of course videos from the lovely Dala from Dala's EV Repair in Finland. The Leaf may not have the fastest charging battery pack in the world. It may not have a liquid cooled battery pack, meaning it is susceptible more often to premature battery aging in certain situations than cars that do have active thermal management. And Nissan most certainly does not look after its customers beyond a certain point when it comes to after sales and service. But the Nissan Leaf is also the most supported electric vehicle in the aftermarket and DIY community that I can think of. It can power your home in an emergency. And while it doesn't have a mass of bells and whistles and over-the-air update shenanigans, it doesn't shred its tires every time you pull away from the stoplight, and it doesn't have expensive tires or require a massive parking space, it's still a fun drive. And, of course, it's a hatchback, not an SUV, which is pretty big in today's SUV and crossover-obsessed world. Wait. Do you hear that sound? Yeah, that's the noise of angry keyboard warriors telling me that I'm an absolute fool for recommending an EV that uses what amounts to a pretty obsolete rapid charging standard, an EV whose battery pack isn't actively cooled, and an EV that just isn't able to do long distance trips with ease. But here's the thing. I, and most EV YouTubers who cover this space, we're not your average car drivers. People who buy the latest and greatest electric cars and drive coast to coast in the US or down to the Mediterranean from the UK for the holidays in their shiny, shiny new ultra-rapid charging EV are also not your average car buyers. 
Your average car buyer wants a vehicle that can get you to and from work every day, costs as little as possible to run, and doesn't require a whole lot of expensive maintenance. They may occasionally want to drive longer distances to see family or to see friends, but they're not going to be driving hundreds of miles every week. In fact, your average car buyer drives very little, so they may not even need a car that can recharge its battery ultra quickly, as long as they have access to overnight charging, which of course is another complete minefield. But remember, I said the Leaf is a good buy for a subset of EV buyers, not all EV buyers. But let's talk about that distance thing. Just how far does your average driver drive? Let's look at the numbers. According to 2019 data from the Federal Highway Administration in the US, Americans drove an average of 14,263 miles per year, or just shy of 23,000 kilometers per year. That is the equivalent of 280 miles per week, which is just under 40 miles per day, 64 kilometers per day. In 2020 through 2022, that figure in the United States dropped significantly, helped by the fact that there was an increase in at-home working. Europeans, though, they drove even less during the same period. Depending on where you look for your actual data, there's quite a lot of variance, the average European drove somewhere between 11,000 and 14,000 kilometers per year in 2019, which is somewhere between 6,500 miles and 8,500 miles. Again, data for 2020 through to the end of last year shows a very similar reduction in driving figures. Interestingly though, the newest generation of drivers are driving far fewer miles than previous generations, aided by the fact that fewer people are bothering to get a driving license, fewer people are buying cars because they're so darned expensive, and they are less likely to live somewhere where a car is required to get to and from places. And of course, there's the whole thing about rent in most major cities around the world now being far far more than the recommended one third of your total monthly salary that most financial advisors advise you spend on housing. So they might not even be able to afford any type of car. The data shows that most people don't drive far enough to require rapid charging on a regular basis. And for many car buyers, day-to-day -day affordability trumps long distance and even rapid charging capabilities. Saving money on a daily driver and then renting a car for long distance trips is not a major issue for many buyers. In fact, many people who own an internal combustion engine vehicle end up renting when they have to drive longer distances already. Many of my friends do this, either because they'd rather have have a larger vehicle with more capabilities than the one they own, or because they're worried their daily driver might not safely make it or require costly repairs if they attempt it. And let's not forget that in Europe, and surprise, surprise, in parts of North America, they have these amazing things that are like massive electric cars with hundreds of seats that can go faster than you're actually allowed to drive on most roads and don't require you to sit behind the wheel because someone else is taking care of that. What are they called again? Tra trains. Of course, this is all predicated on the fact that you have to have access to off-street parking and charging every day, either at home or at work. And if you are renting, as I know many of you watching do, you will likely not have access to that. And if that's the case for you, the leaf probably won't work. But if you own your own home or you are lucky enough to rent a house rather than an apartment, they do exist, you can actually get by with a limited range electric car like a Nissan Leaf and with newer versions of the Leaf having longer distance battery packs, there's something for most people who don't live miles away from the nearest town or think that driving coast to coast is a fun long weekend activity. And if you really want to buy a new one, you can still buy a new Leaf today with a full warranty and all the latest bells and whistles and gadgets that Nissan offers on the Leaf. And it's still one of the most affordable EVs you can buy today new when you consider its range offered. 
Aha, but what about the battery? I hear you ask. Well, while battery degradation is a known and common problem for leaves that have been treated hard, i.e. they've spent part of their life living in a very hot place or are rapid charged and driven long distances a lot, there are also plenty of Nissan Leaf owners out there who report high odometer readings on their cars while also reporting minimal battery degradation. Essentially, if you live in a really hot place like Arizona, the Nissan Leaf might not be a good buy for you. But if you live in a more temperate place, go right ahead. And even if you were to buy an OG Leaf on the used car market with a limited battery capacity due to significant battery degradation, not all hope is lost if you are willing to invest in your car, either through time, money, or ideally both. Unlike pretty much every other EV out there, you can buy replacement battery packs both new and used for your Leaf. Sure, Nissan will stiff you for your life savings if you try and buy directly from the official Nissan dealership near you. And in some countries around the world, Nissan won't actually sell you a pack unless you remortgage your house and hand over your firstborn. But in other parts of the world, you can now buy used replacement packs that have been verified as having a healthy battery pack capacity, healthy cell balancing, and no known defects at the point of purchase. You can even pay to upgrade your Nissan Leaf battery pack from an original 24 or 30 kilowatt hours all the way up to 60 kilowatt hours or more, giving an original Leaf nearly three times its original range per charge. Here in Portland, Oregon, where the channel is based, there's a garage that will help you replace your Leaf battery pack. Link in the description for a feature we did on them a while back. In Europe, there are several choices, including the amazing and wonderful Dala from Dala's EV Repairs. Again, link to his channel in the description. His based in Finland and not only does upgrades for Leaf customers, but also offers a slew of other aftermarket tweaks to give a used Nissan Leaf a brand new lease on life. And these are just two of an entire cottage industry that has grown up to support the aging Nissan Leaf and keep it on the road. Even in Aotearoa or New Zealand, there's a company promising a brand new battery pack option coming to the market soon. And if you are in the market for a vehicle that's good for vehicle to grid, and the Ford F-150 Lightning and its home integration system is just too expensive, or you can't get one, and believe me, it is very expensive, then the Nissan Leaf has your back. In Europe, you've been able to buy a Chidemo based vehicle to grid system for a Leaf and your house for a number of years, and a system from Fermata Energy was recently given approval to be sold in the US. Sure, you won't have quite the massive battery pack of a more modern, more expensive EV to keep your home running, but Chidemo's vehicle to home system is proven and reliable and. Well, frankly, CCS's home to vehicle system is still trying to iron out the kinks. There's even not yet technically a CCS compatible vehicle to home standardization yet. There's just a bunch of automakers trying to implement what they hope will become the official ratified standard. As for driving, well, the Nissan Leaf isn't an exciting car per se to drive. It won't burn off the competition at the lights unless you modify it with a more powerful motor. Dala's done that, by the way. And it isn't a driver's car per se, but let's be honest, last year we were rightly criticised by many of you for focusing too heavily on cars that gave that driver engagement over affordability, practicality and pretty much everything else. And if you are more interested in getting to work safely in one piece, using as little energy as possible, the Nissan Leaf is a car that can do that. My closing thought, if you are of a certain age, you might remember the birth and death of such devices as the all-in-one hi-fi system of the 1980s and TV, DVD, VCR combos of the 1990s. And if you owned one, you'll probably remember that they were capable of doing all the things, but not really very well. And the chances are, if you remember them, you've aged a bit like I have, and you probably now spend your money on hi-fi separates or discrete AV components to do each of the things you specifically want them to do. 
and have a better system as a result. Sure, rapid charging is a pill in the Nissan Leaf. In the US, Chademo is the poorer cousin of CCS, and CCS in turn is the unloved stepchild of Tesla's ultra-fast supercharger standard when it comes to network reliability. But one of the reasons we've got to the point where everyone seems to be driving around in multi-ton, super expensive SUVs and crossovers is because we as a society have conditioned ourselves to expect a tool to do all the things rather than focus on doing a few things really well. And the Nissan Leaf, it does the daily commute and vehicle to home really, really well. If you've got to the end of this video, well, first of all, congratulations, and you probably want more information. So check out the linked videos below where we talk about some of the caveats of buying used EVs, including things to check out for, and when you should just turn away and run. And by the way, when it comes to the Nissan Leaf, making sure you know how to check the battery pack using Leaf Spy or similar, or you happen to know someone who does, is not only a recommended factor of buying a used leaf, but an essential thing to do before you say yes and sign your John Hancock. That said, as with every purchase decision, a little bit of research before you say yes can reward you immensely in the long run. And remember, you don't have to buy a used e That's it, thanks for joining me, and I'll see you next time. And on that note, we are done with today's video, the first in-studio recorded video of 2023. Happy New Year. If you like this video, you know what to do and feel free to tip us with a super thanks. And the comments are also open for your thoughts, as is our Discord chat room. There are links below. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin and swag store. And do check out our Mastodon server where you can keep up to date with everything that we are making. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our self-driving tier supporters Mike Weeder, Linda Irish, Sean Tucker, Patrick Boyarski, Paul Nelson, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Muir Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Taza in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Carl Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Ray Jean Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Ascentar, and Jim Burness. Finally, super out of this world thanks to our top tier supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Dave Kitchen, Aaron Hahn, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and Ian. Well, I'll be back soon with more awesome videos, as will the rest of the team. But until then, enjoy the rest of your day. And as always, keep evolving. I know some of you are going to want to know what this t-shirt says, because whenever I wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it, you always want to know what it says. It's very simple. It just says, words are hard. It is a t-shirt that my partner purchased for me a long time ago, and I've only just been able to fit in it because of my weight loss. And it comes from another awesome content creator duo, Evan and Caitlin. If you don't know who they are and you haven't heard of Resin Time, go check them out. I'll link to them below.